and they're local, and it's called time. And then the number two, two Y is the, or maybe I'm not. Look, see, I'm, what they do but I'm, South American Spanish. but why can't I see you? Oh, there we go. Oh, Megan's on. Why can't I see? Oh, there we go. Oh, there. If we, you're, you want to learn Spanish and you want to immerse it, so you, you need to get on my your audio and you start talking to them. them. Okay, that's what she does. And yeah, yeah. So it's just taken off. And so she's, I, she's got all these people yeah, working stuff on her video yeah. now. Um, but she, you know, makes sure that they're, they're good people to do it. And uh, she did phone into Hong Kong to learn how to speak Spanish. So um, yeah, it's very, very cool. So yeah. 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 Um, only Spanish. Is only Spanish. Only Spanish. Correct. Yeah. Because that's that's tough enough. So, uh, and she's staying you know, that I mean, way. I don't know if she'll like flip it. You know what I'm saying? And say, and then when like people you can pin, speaking, but she wants like, you can sort of play around. around right? Like you may you have her like, go click that. So, so and we probably don't even want. We're gonna want to pin yeah. Carrington. My my other friend, um, and she's there. Bernie Marino. He's from oh, Colombia. Okay. He owns Twenty Eight yeah. Cardio. Yeah. And so, then go. To, I always go to me. Go down there to test them now. But he's doing blockchain or, or card titles. To try um, and test the beaker and micro card titles. Brother on I'm here. I think it's his brother. So about is that. Is Spanish is testing, a, testing. I don't know how to speak Spanish. Oh no. No. Okay. I speak Portuguese and French. Gotcha. <laughs> and English. Okay. Learn. I'm going yeah. to go. I'm yeah. leaving. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah, really good. It's so helpful for me. Yeah. 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 Sit at home and uh, yeah. make money. <laughs> yeah. And also come back and I'll come back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. No, yeah. you suggested yeah. and also yeah. LinkedIn, um, LinkedIn. Yeah. 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 Yeah, where where, how can I watch this on LinkedIn or anything? Well, like, so go, that's okay. Learn it like, oh, he was a member. It's nice because they can choose the the country. I already talked to a girl from the UK. Mm -hmm. And I talk a lot about the people. Hello, hello, good people. Because it's a topic. So today is one of these special days. I'm I just got off something with a group of for the State Department of Actually, we were talking about Mount Silicon Valley. I then came okay. here. I have a speaker event with um uh, an executive at L'Oreal for our speaker series who's a friend of mine from college. So I'm going to pop off right when Lisa Delp pops on. Perfect. Because, and then I'll pop back on. Right. Which I guess is the advantage of being virtual classes. And the co-instructor. Uh, that is right, that is right. So Alex, how would you just, the, uh, the surprise, um, Shark Tank episode last. Did you enjoy the having those? The were you one of the one? I can't remember if you made a critical comment of their negotiating before they popped on. Was that you too? Yeah, I did. I criticized them. That was funny. Yeah, that was a good first class. We'll see if you get on. That. Well, that's the problem. I think it's probably better to do a really great class like that as your last class. 
and then give everybody the 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 about the course evaluations because if it's your first class then people you know they can't remember the good one it's all it's only downhill from there <laughs> oh goodness all right we are at 11 47 um so we'll give it another few minutes because I'm looking and I, and I told those of you that are popping in, I'm testing out a new shooting space we have in the Peter B. Lewis building today. And it allows us to see like people bigger through square and then do one for the day. But oh, there you go. See, I didn't see the pros in a really awkward position. Oh, that's great. Oh, lovely. Okay. Everybody, everybody do this. Of the screen, but this is, this is kind of hard for the rest of us to actually hold our hands up. It's like tiring. Yeah, okay. So, good. Well, it's funny, Lisa, and it's funny. I think what we've been doing, although it looks like both of our guests, I see Jeffrey, our guest is sitting with you from Uganda, and it looks like Lisa was able to join. The way we've been kind of setting this up is to have kind of a little bit of chat before inviting folks at noon, but when we send the invite out, so we, I mean, we obviously are lucky to have yep. our guests here now, but we'll wait for people to join, but Suzanne, I'll, I'll turn it over to you. Yep. So, okay, well, we can see, uh, this is this is going to be, if my camera goes off at all, it'll be because I'm frozen. Uh, let me get our recording started. So we, we will go ahead and get started. I know we are a little few minutes past time. Um, you know, first and foremost, I want to say to the students, uh, thanks for your flexibility. Uh, we had sent out the group assignments for everybody. And then right after we sent out the group assignments, there was a flurry of activity on, oh, I'm changing my registration and I'm not gonna be in the class anymore. And therefore I shouldn't be in this team. And as we uh, said to everybody, we really want the teams to have uh, at least two people from case on each team. And after we had the um, issue with folks dropping the class or some folks adding the class that messed up all of the teams that we had so carefully curated and sent out to everybody. Okay, so I'm just going to go with my camera off right now and I'll fix it once our speakers start. Um, so I do appreciate again everybody's patience as we get that as we get that worked out. I think the drop ad period is pretty much done. So we should be able to get updated teams out to you guys this week. The good thing is that um, we didn't have a group project that was due this week, so everybody should still have plenty of time to get to know your groups and work on those projects. So without further ado, then we'll just jump right into kind of our speakers since they are here. And we want to make sure that we are making use, um, the best use of their time rather than having them kind of just sit here. So we, I know we had had group two, uh, or one had originally been assigned to do introductions today, uh, but since we got rid of the groups, um, probably don't have group that's ready to do that. So sorry about that. But Lisa, um, Lisa Dell is an amazing partner. Um, she is always so generous with her time at, when, in coming here to speak to students in this class. So Lisa, um, if you are there and you can come on off mute, I will just let you speak for yourself and introduce yourself to our class. Let me, I am here. And let me, because I can't help myself, say a hello and a, just a couple words about Lisa. And Lisa, it's funny, I literally, a half an hour ago, because you're in my slide deck, there's a picture of you from 2012. Oh, 
Hello, everyone. Can you guys unmute real quick and just test the audio so I can make sure I can. Yeah, my, 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 oh. Hey, Megan, sorry. I'm, I'm multitasking with two classes. That's okay. Hide your, hide your toe. It's broke. It's broken. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, I got an x-ray. Look, I, I was worried that maybe the foot was broken. Luckily, that's not the case. So, um, but yeah, it's broken. Yes. <laughs> can you hear all, um, everyone okay, Megan? Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Can you still hear me? Yeah. Yeah, just I know it's kind of awkward, but if you look at your screen and talk, it, I can hear you and okay. it'll be it'll look better if you're looking at your screen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And you'll Megan K mm -hmm. kind of monitor LinkedIn like you did before. And yeah. Megan I'll paste that. anything in the chat in Zoom that comes up. Um hey, how are you? and so like either whoever sees it first, Stacy or Megan, you guys can just see that there's, if there's a chat from LinkedIn, I'll paste it in. Right. Yeah, I probably won't be looking at LinkedIn too much, but if you post it. Put it in the chat. It, she can send it yeah. to you. Yeah. Don't even worry about that. Yeah, yeah, I'll just do it in the Zoom chat. I'm going to close like all my tabs. Nothing to kick off. And then toss like, it to yeah. Megan. And then you'll ask her. Just ask her to introduce. You know, yeah, I'll don't, introduce don't. myself. Too. Yeah. Okay. And then just ask. Don't do like a long time. You know, yeah. Do you have an intro or just. Yeah. Just be like, or do you want me I would to just do her title and just be like, can you introduce, you know, it's always. Okay. Better. Hey, are you, Michael? I am Genesis. Nice um, I'm actually a first year. Um, <laughs> nice oh, to meet you. Right. Have you been to Pink Fox before? 
I toured here when I first uh, toured mm -hmm. and I haven't been back and I've wanted to come second semester new year all about getting out there. Yes, great. Good. Glad you're here. Where are you from? I'm from Maryland. Where? I'm I'm in PG County, so oh, okay. I'm like 10 minutes out. I live in Frederick. So Ooh. yeah. I mean you're closer to DC than I am. But yeah. What school did you go? Uh Urbana. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> What school did you go to? Oh, I it's just to College Park. Okay, so it's um, it's Eleanor Roosevelt. So a lot of people. Oh, okay. Kind of live in. Thank you, Martin. Hi. Well, hello, hello. Hey. It, it's it's been a while. It's been a minute or two, hasn't been it? Been a minute. How are this you? This is so fun. I know. I I um uh, I was trying to find the photo of you when you came back from um College Jeopardy. College Madhouse. I wish it was College Jeopardy. <laughs> for for twenty years, I've been saying College Jeopardy. I've been literally bragging you know, to people, like saying, "My friend." And I, I also tell people that you won. So if you didn't, don't. I don't even want to know. <laughs> well, it's funny. I did win College Mad. I mean, College Jeopardy would have been good. College Madhouse was, um, although in, in the host. Like, here's a little trivia question: The host of College Madhouse went on to become like a actually actor. I'm not saying renowned, Greg Kinnear. Remember that guy? Oh, yeah. Uh, he was 100%. the host of College Madhouse, America's favorite game show. Yeah. I mean, could have been you. Could have been me. <laughs> um, been you. Well, thanks for doing this. We'll, we will. I'm going to start the, I'm we'll going to start the LinkedIn. I'll, I'll give you a thumbs up. Yeah, give me a thumbs up because we'll be, we'll be on Zoom. We've got a few folks here. A few folks will join and then a few folks are on LinkedIn. Hi, Megan and Megan. Hi. 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 <laughs> Megan Duro. Goldie, we should you should make Andrew do this too, you know. He's right in the next room. Get him over here. I know. I know. I could do a little tag team and kind of like you know, by the way, you're well, I'll, let me get kicked off because we are on um we are now streaming, but I'll I'll weave in a couple of other past participants in this speaker series of people that you know. So um it's great. My name is Michael Goldberg. I'm our executive director of the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship here and a professor at the Weatherhead School of Management. Um, and it's great to welcome my friend Carrington Cole to our um entrepreneurship speaker series um Carrington and I went to college together as um did uh, her husband who's also a good friend who's a, who's a googler um other Princeton alums to have participated in this speaker series include drum roll please Jonas Pate on the day that Outer Banks dropped oh um he joined us to talk about the dynamics of making television in the world of Netflix. That was fun. Yeah. Um, Robert Musselwhite, um, at the time, after his acquisition um, from the advisory board, has, has joined. Um, and, and others, and others, I can't even recall some of the list, but you you are among our college friends that are part of this, and the list, the list will continue. So I love it. it's great. It's great to have you here. Um, our sessions are always moderated by students um, and, and Megan Nellis, um, who um, I've gotten to know as a student. She's done some work on our alumni venture fund, has had an interest in the beauty industry writ large for a long time, um, and is going to moderate the discussion. Um, we'd love these to be interactive. So we have a couple of folks in the room here today, um, folks on Zoom and folks on LinkedIn. So let us know your questions either if you're here kind of just raise your hand and chime in if you're on zoom um, just raise your zoom hand and if you're on linkedin just put your question in the comments so with that welcome carrington i will turn it over to Thank megan you. ellis i feel so honored to be robert musselwhite and jonas pate that's a pretty good company <laughs> that's, a good, that's a good i group. feel honored <laughs> thanks okay well, hi, thank you so much for joining us, Carrington. Uh, really excited for this session. And so just to start off, um, 
you know, as Michael said, if anybody has a question, like please enter it in the chat or raise your hand on Zoom or even on LinkedIn, we'll get those questions and we'd love to hear them. And to start off, you know, Carrington, if you could just give a little background about yourself, and I know you have worked many years at L'Oreal in many different positions, and yeah, just a little bit about your career journey. My career path, okay. So um, I, I've been, actually it'll be 20 years in March, which is, not, which is not normal these days for someone to stay at a company for 20 years, but it hasn't felt like one company all the time because I've moved around. Um, but I think part of the, the reason why I have stayed so long I, I didn't start until I was a little bit older. I started at L'Oreal in my early 30s. Um, and my 20s, if I'm really honest, I will tell you my 20s were not linear. Um, I And actually, maybe I should even start it sooner, which is I was a swimmer in college. Much uh, I was on the swim team at Princeton with Robert Musselwhite, who I know was one of your speakers. Um, but we, as a swimmer, you know, you're super disciplined, super um, kind of regimented and and so when I graduated from college, I didn't want to be disciplined or regimented at all. I wanted to explore, experience, travel, backpack. And so I did all that and more. And, um, and, and you know, that lasted for a lot of my 20s until um, my late 20s, I went to business school. I went to business school actually in Barcelona, Spain. Um, so we, we can talk about that too. Um, and then that subsequently led to the role at L'Oreal. So I, it was a little late. I was a little late coming to the game, but then um, joined L'Oreal at age 32 and, um, and have been there ever since. And I've, I've stayed in, um, you know, we have different divisions within L'Oreal and I joined something called the professional products division, which is salon, hair care, and color. And, and I've been there ever since. And, and that's not necessarily common at L'Oreal. There's a lot of movement around, which is one of the things that I actually love about the company. Um, so people do move quite a bit. Uh, I, I have moved within PPD, but I've stayed in PPD. And I think it just as a, the division really resonated with me. Um, it's a little, you know, that our customer, our first customer before the end consumer is the hairdresser. And, you know, I love hairdressers. They're, you know, they have a lot of heart. They're quirky, um, which totally works with me, and um, and it and it feels different. They're all small entrepreneur, you know, small business owners. They're entrepreneurs, so it's uh, it feels different to be sitting, you know, to be doing something uh, marketing or or um, you know driving their business for them versus maybe sitting across the table from like you know a buyer at, at Target or Walmart or something. So that just worked for me and I've been there um, ever since and, and moved within PPD and different brands, like six or seven different brands. Um, and ironically, I've now, the first brand that I joined was Matrix and I started as an assistant manager, assistant marketing manager. And then two and a half years ago, I had the opportunity to come back to Matrix as the general manager. So I, it's, it's nice to come back here versus there, but it's been good. The whole, the whole, um, 20 years actually has been has been really good, really positive. That's amazing. Yeah, well, it sounds like you've done so much at your time uh, with L'Oreal. So I was wondering, you know, what is it sort of like working in the beauty market? You know, I know you've had a couple of different positions, but day to day, you know, it's such a fast paced industry, especially when you consider marketing and like all the new products that come out. So yeah, what, what is your kind of day to day? Sure. Well, um, probably to set it up, I'll, I'll tell you that the way L'Oreal is, um, is set up, we have a global marketing team and, the, and depending on where the brand is, uh, you know, whether it's a French brand or an American brand, typically those global teams sit in either Paris or in the New York headquarters. Um, and then there are the operational marketing teams within each of the countries. And I have always been on the operational team. So I've always been on operational marketing for the US. And what, what basically the way that works is that the global team is responsible for coming up with the concept, coming up you know, for the product, working with the labs to put the juice in the product, um, working on the packaging, the, the campaign, you know, the model campaign around it, what that's gonna look like, our, our, um, the positioning. They come up with all that and then they hand it off to the countries. And then our job is to go and, um, and, and basically take it to market. So we come up with a go-to-market plan. 
um, which includes you know, our distribution, um, our pricing strategy, our um, education support, our, uh, you know, our local marketing support, um, all of that, that we, you know, that brings it to life in the country, um, in the U.S. And, and um, generally people feel that, you know, the, the general feeling is that the global marketing team is like, if you're, if you're a real creative, that and very conceptual thinker, that that's more for you. Whereas on the, on the operational side, it's a bit more, you're going to need a little bit more of that analytical side. Um, cause it's very numbers driven and you have to, um, you know, both teams have to be, have to be numbers driven, but I, definitely on the operational side, it's a bit more of, um, you know, we're, we're responsible for the PL, we're responsible for driving sales. Um, so I've always been on the operational side. And one thing I love about that is that I wear a lot of different hats. I, I started, uh, in marketing and up until, you know, a, a two and a half years ago when I took the matrix job. Then I became a general manager, and then education and sales um, was was falling, uh, you know, under me as well. But prior to that, I'd always been in marketing, and one of the great things about marketing is just that you know wearing so many different hats, and um, and it's very good for people who have that right left brain balance, which I you know, that I feel like that's uh, that's something I love, and and you know as a result, your day the day goes from you know meeting with um, sales to align on our, uh, on our P&L objectives to then meeting with my education team, which is, um, you know, kind of the head of for a hairdresser, you know, in an in a industry like ours, that means training hairdressers. So then I'm talking about, you know, a technique, a trend, and how we're going to bring that to life um, to then meeting with the marketing team and, you know, going through their uh, 360 launch plans. Um, and then potentially meeting with demand planning about our out of stocks, which is not my favorite meeting. So things, you know, it, it, I like that ability to, to wear a lot of different hats. And, um, and I will say that at L'Oreal specifically, and probably, you know, marketing in general, there, there's, it's, it's a lot of um, solving problems, which, you know, are sometimes big fires that need to be put out, but sometimes more just long, you know, strategic uh, problems that we're thinking about, thorny things that we're sort of digging into and coming up with solutions. And, and, um, and it, it's a nice balance of, you know, short-term fires that need to be put out and long-term vision and strategy. Um, so I don't know if that, if that kind of paints a picture, but it's never boring. And that was the one thing I remember when I interviewed um, with one of my, what, who would be my future colleague, she said, you know, you'll never be bored here. And it's true. In 20 years, I have never been bored ever. <laughs> That's awesome. So it's a lot of like cross-functional teamwork and you get to see a lot 100%. of the company. If you can't, if you don't work well with others, if you don't, don't play in the sandbox well, this, it is not a good role or a good company <laughs> for you. <laughs> well, yeah, thank you for sharing that. And um I guess, you know, you, you have been in the beauty industry and at L'Oreal for so long. So what's some differences that you see from when you started in the industry versus now, especially with all the kind of current challenges that have come up in the last few years? Yeah, uh, um, but I would say one of the big, so when I started 20 years ago, the industry was so, 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 so different. Um, a, a lot of what we did as marketers was sell products into a distributor into the sales team, you know, because yeah, yeah. It, 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 it's, Sorry, it's, I just wanted to join. Whoop, that's not me, is it? Okay. Um, it, it was in those days, a lot of the, um, it, there were a lot of different independent distributors that would carry, you know, we're responsible for then selling our products. And we did not, they did not fall under, um, they, we did not own our distribution. They were all independent distributors all across the country, like 12 or 13. And so our job was really to get the product into them. So if you think about it, it it's like all of our marketing efforts stopped at the salesperson. We, you know, we weren't thinking about the, the customer, the, the hairdresser or the salon or the stylist. And then we definitely weren't thinking about the consumer, the end consumer, the client that's sitting in the chair. We really were focused on that first part of the of the um the chain of the channel and then not getting beyond that and in 20 years i'll say that is the number one thing that has changed we now have a direct relationship with our customer and a direct relationship with our consumer and there's so many different marketing levers that we can pull to reach them um, obviously digital marketing has changed everything and it continues to change 
um, you know, we think we've got, our, we've got, all right, we've got our Snapchat, we've got our Pinterest, we've got our, our uh, Instagram, our Facebook strategy, we've got all that. And then you're like, TikTok, we got to have a TikTok. And now, and you know, now my daughter's talking about be real. I don't even know what that is. And I, I like, but we probably need to have a strategy. So every day there's a new uh, platform, a new channel, a new lever that we seem to need to, um, you know, have a strategy for and have a plan for, um, which is exciting. You know, there's a lot more, these are just more ways that we can connect with our, with our consumer, with our customer. Oh, Megan, I think you're on mute. Okay, good. Okay, sorry. Yeah, so many screens, that's okay. So I was just saying, yeah, that that's so different than today's world, especially with like digital marketing that you're mentioning. And that must change so quickly for you. I mean, like is, especially I guess in the last like couple of years, is that something that's like really been, um, you know, an initiative or something that changes like much faster than it used to? Yeah. Well, you know, I think that L'Oreal was very well set up when when the pandemic hit, you know, obviously we all shifted to online. And I think that, you know, we saw different parts of our business um, benefit from that. Like, it, it, you know, our, our e-com business went through the roof. However, um, I think that the, the I do credit the L'Oreal culture because we had already been upskilling ourselves in digital marketing for a decade. And, and in a, in a very, I will say one thing about this company and um, you know, obviously I've been there 20 years, so I love it. So I, I'm, I don't mean to push it, but it's going to be a positive story. I wouldn't stay there for 20 years, but you know, one thing I will say is that when we, when we decide we want to take something seriously and we want to invest in it and we want to upskill ourselves, we do it. And, uh, you know, I saw us go from, I remember back when we were uh, in the L, the L2 think tank, they used to, you know, um, give you a, a grade in terms of how digitally savvy you were, like your digital IQ, and we were feeble. And yeah. within three years, we became gifted. So it was, it's really, um, you know, when we yeah. invest in it, when we, when we set the, the, the intention, I've seen the, the dramatic change that takes place. And that happened with digital marketing. So we became very um, skilled. And, and I think that the pandemic, we were pretty well set up for that. Um, one thing that it, that it shifted specifically in my division um, is that, you know, we were doing education. When I talk about education, it is literally going in and, and teaching um, stylists and hairdressers how to use our products. Um, and that's a, that's something that we do. Um, we invest a lot in, you know, we have a, a team out there that's, that's covering the country and doing that. And so when, you know, that was basically done in person, we had not like digital education was not something that, that we were uh, doing a whole lot of and, and uh, at least my brand matrix. And then when, when the pandemic happened, that all shifted and we started reaching our customer um, with digital education, digital which education. Has, been, um, has continued. It's dropped off a little bit. It's dropped off a little bit. Live. I'm getting an echo. I don't know if that's just an echo. I don't know if that's just but it has, uh, but it has, it has continued uh, and given us a, a, just even more opportunities to connect with our with our customer. That that is really awesome. Speaking of kind of like um, innovations, you know, L'Oreal really putting their mind to, to make the changes. I am you know, as a leader in the beauty industry. How does L'Oreal approach entrepreneurship and innovation? You know, inside and outside of the company. Mm. I, I mean, I, I do think that this is. It's funny because. I always wanted to be an entrepreneur. I, I did not intend to join a big company. And um, my, both my parents were small business owners. And I always thought, you know, and that's why I went to business school, actually, um, because I, I, I wasn't going because I thought I was going to come out and end up working for a big company. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And I remember I was, I was living in Spain at the time because I'd gone to business school in Spain. And I, I got on the L'Oreal website. And it was, you know, my eyes were open and I was like, Oh my God, you know, I think, I think this could actually be a good place for me. Um, because it, there was a lot about valuing, you know, the path, like my path, I told you in my twenties was not very linear. It was a lot of backpacking and, you know, yeah. traveling and stuff like that. And, um, and it, it, they, in the, on the website, I remember it just sounded like they really would value that kind of life experience. And so I, I, um, I think that, um, that L'Oreal has always valued that, but there's there's 
definitely what, what really pulled me in is it's kind of a growth mindset. This is a company that as big as it is and as cumbersome as sometimes, you know, big companies can feel, there's definitely a nimble mindset and an agile mindset. And, um, and, and, you know, within the company, there is um, a, a culture of growth, constant growth. We also do have, you know, so that, that's just sort of like the culture, the culture and you feel it and that's the energy. It's, it's a go, 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 you know, always looking for new solutions, new ways to do things, never getting stale. Definitely there's a lot of, of emphasis and it comes from the top on, you know, change, like keep up, um, always be ahead of the curve, that kind of thing. We also do have something, um, you know, there are things within the company that, that support that. And one of them is a, is a um, program um, called Beauty Shakers. And I think I might've told you about this, Megan, but it's a, um, every year there, it's a competition. It's an internal competition where we can submit ideas in different um, topics. Now they've added sustainability as a, as a recent one, but it, you know, we can um, submit ideas and the winner gets their idea brought to life. You get some money and you get your idea, um, you know, executed. So there's this constant, it's just a culture that's focused on, on, um, you know, continuously looking for new ways to do things. And that works, you know, for those of us who like, at this point in my life, I, I think I might have to let that, you know, dream of starting my own business go. I'm not sure that's going to happen at this point, but it it's a great place for someone like me who wants that entrepreneurial spirit within sort of a frame. Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, freedom within the frame or chaos within the frame, but it works for me. <laughs> So that's, that's really very cool. And I guess someone who keeps up with the beauty industry, I know you, you always have to be innovating. You know, there's always something new kind of around the corner. So I'm sure there's a lot that goes on um, in terms of that L'Oreal. Uh, I would love to know kind of what your experience has been, you know, as a woman in this industry, you know, what are the challenges, how you have been supported by the company, and I don't know, any advice you have for kind of young women also trying to go into industry? I, I think that um, L'Oreal is a, obviously it's a great, it's a great company. Well, I say, obviously, I, I say that just because I think um, our customer, you know, is, uh, is in many cases a woman. And, um, and so a lot of women are interested in this, in this, uh, in this industry and interested in L'Oreal. And, and it's, um, for me, it's been a great place as a woman to be. And, you know, when we, when I look at things like, our maternity leave policy, uh, things like that. It just, it supports um, women in overt ways through policy, but also um, I have been um, really lucky with, with my mentors. And you know, we talked a lot about sponsorship and having, uh, you know, having uh, someone that's actually supporting you through and sponsoring you and mentoring you. And I've been fortunate to have that. Um, and I think there are, I'm not alone. There are a lot of there are a lot of people at L'Oreal who are getting sponsored and who are getting or, or mentored. Um, my boss of the last seven years, who's the president of the PPD brands, um, is, a, is a woman who um, has been at L'Oreal for over 30 years. And I feel like uh, having her as a mentor, a leader and a coach has been just incredible. I mean, she's had a huge impact on my life. Um, but I do think that the company is also very, um, we have a lot of, uh, there's a lot of attention given to including being more diverse and inclusive. We have a DEI um, board, um, certainly in the last two years, there's been a lot of attention paid to that. Um, we've, we have for many years had a, um, it, it, it used to be a day that was all about women in leadership and women in, in um, you know, in corporate America, but now it's been expanded to be more um, inclusive of all uh, diversity and diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it's, it's kind of expanded, but I do think that there's a lot of, and, it, and it's all, and it's, it's a whole day that we spend talking about topics um, that are of particular interest to women or other minority groups um, at L'Oreal and without and, and in the industry in general. Wow, that's really awesome. Um, yeah, you know, I'll just take a pause right here. I don't know if there's anybody in the room here who would like to ask any questions or anybody on um, LinkedIn or Zoom that has any questions. Just want to take a moment. Yeah. Yeah. 
So uh, you, you touched on this before about um, this past year and a lot of the changes that have happened. Something particular that I find interesting is, you know, TikTok and the growth of TikTok. You talked about how Corona uh, kind of did away or maybe reduced, minimized uh, the people who were going out and teaching people how to use your products. Um, and TikTok is very different from uh, a lot of the social media that was pri primarily used for like advertising in the past five years. You know, it is very visual. It talks about creative, you know, it uses creative uh, devices. You're expected to um, engage more, um, to uh, be favored in the algorithm. So how did you adjust to that big change and, you know, that uh, rise in consumption that came with TikTok, maybe like, um, and you, you talked about hacks as well, um, beauty finds, that hashtag. Um, you know, there's like so many threads that came up TikTok that uh, really uh, built and added to the beauty industry, uh, definitely interesting in it. So I, you froze, you all froze for a second there. So um, I, I didn't, there was a bit in the middle there that I didn't hear, but if the, is the question about how are we, able to how are we leveraging specifically TikTok or social media in general I think TikTok and like how you've dealt with that rise in consumption consumption in a different way yeah so I mean I think with any as with any social media platform and you know every every I feel like there's always um not every day but there there is this sort of constant um uh awareness of you know potentially new platforms that are that are are going to be big or or maybe aren't going to be big and we have to figure that out but as on all social media it's all about being authentic and so we actually don't have a matrix um, tiktok account right now and the reason we don't is because brands don't often come across very authentically on tiktok and instead it's about creators and so partnering with creators and then that is you know it brings a whole question of okay which creators are you going to partner with and how do you make sure that that's authentic so it's not just specific but it is it is um i would say uh it is even more important on tiktok given the specificities of that channel um but it's always you know we always have to think about who are the who are the creators who are the influencers that we are partnering with to make sure that it's that it is um authentic and and so we we always um you know, when we are engaging, some of our influencers are paid and some of them aren't, and we always disclose, they they have to disclose when they are paid. Um, but, you know, for us, it, we don't look at that as just a pay to play, like we're going to pay you to to post on behalf. We have relationships with our, with our influencers, um, our professional, and these are professional influencers. These are, you know, hairdressers that, um, we, and we do sometimes work with consumer influencers, but more often we work with professional influencers. Um, so it's really about picking, you know, the right ones, having the right partnership with them, and then investing in that partnership so that it's not a one and done, so that we're really building together. And if we don't, if we, if it's like dating, right? If you, if we, if we go down that path and we find that we don't have the, the same values, um, then that's fine. You know, we don't, we don't continue the partnership. But I, I think that's why, you know, we don't, we don't yet have a matrix TikTok account because we just don't, we haven't found that to feel authentic. Instead, the creators are really the ones who make that that feel more authentic. Does that answer the question or did I just totally skirt it? <laughs> yeah, it really does. That's an interesting insight about how like, that, uh, that authenticity, um, you did talk about that, like how um, these people are being connected with, with the outside world. And it's that's kind of like how it's different than a lot of other platforms. So. How are you um, looking forward to the future in terms of social media and different ways of marketing? I mean, uh, well, Meta. <laughs> Meta might be like one of the upcoming things. We don't really know about it. Oh, what happened to Meta? But, you know, like, what are you looking forward to the future in terms of marketing and with engaging with your uh, customers? How are you looking forward to that? I mean, it's really just continuing to find um, ways to. Uh, you know, ways to engage and all that. I, I sound like a broken record, but it's really looking for more platforms and ways to connect authentically. 
Um, and because there's, you know, as a consumer, you smell inauthenticity a mile away, right? And you're, you're not going to engage. So, you know, we can throw all the content we want at you. And if it's not engaging content, or if you don't feel like it's an, it's authentic content, then you're not going to, um, you know, you're not going to respond to it. Um, you're just going to, you know, turn away from it, in fact, and then it can actually work to your detriment. So it, it's really about finding the right content, finding off that. And, and, it, and I will tell you, it's, it's actually an interesting challenge for us right now. So I, I um, Megan and I talked a little bit about this, that um, I'm in a unique position because when I started uh, two and a half years ago on Matrix, we were right at, on, the, on the verge of renovating the brand. So this is, mine is a brand that's been around for um, for 40 years. We founded, the, there was a hairdresser named Artie Miller who founded Matrix in 1980. And it's, it's over the last 40 years, it's had ups and downs, but it was time for a refresh, right? So we, when I came in two and a half years ago, we started working on this renovation. And a year and a half ago, we renovated the brand in the middle of a pandemic with no way to connect live with our, with our customers. And I'm talking about, you know, our salon customers. Um, and, and a live touch point with them is still very, very important in our, in our industry. Um, you know, digital marketing can do a lot, but it can't, in, in our industry, we have to do both in the professional products division with hairdressers. We have to do both. It's an, and not an, or, um, so we didn't have a live touch point. Um, and it, you know, that has been really, really difficult. So, and, 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 you know, always when you're change, when you change and you renovate and you're, you know, we, in our case, we were discontinuing some, some lines of, um, some color ranges, which hair color you know, just to put that in perspective, when you, if you go to get your hair colored at a salon and this, and the stylist puts a new color on your hair and you turn around, it's not what you were expecting or what you've been getting for the last few years, you're, you're, you're furious. So when you, whenever you change something like that, it's all, there's always a lot of, of angst and, um, and we changed some things and there was a lot of angst. And so that's been, it's been really disruptive for the last year and a half on my brand um, specifically. And so um, I kind of forgot where I was going with that whole thing, but that that's, you know, I'm in a, in this unique position, um, where I need to, we're trying to renovate this brand and bring this brand out to the market and, and, you know, kind of create a new, a new, um, connection with our brand, with our um, customers and with our consumers. Oh, oh, I know where I was going. So the, the balance of creator led content and brand content is really important. Because if, if it's all creator content, then you don't see the brand. And I just renovated this brand so that we have consistency, you know, everywhere. Um, it was a global renovation too. So there's consistency around the world. And, you know, if I rely too much on, on like UGC and on creator like content, it's, I'm not really going to be able to bring my new brand to life at the same time. If I am all branded content, then it feels a little bit stiff, right? So it's the right balance of the two that we need to nail. And right now, um, we've been really heavy on the branded content, and I need mm -hmm. more UGC, and I need more creator-led content. So if any of you are great creators, we can talk. <laughs> wow, that, that, that was super informative. Actually, funny point, um, Michael brought up to me, or Professor Goldberg, that Matrix was actually started in... Um, Ohio, I believe, and then it was acquired yep. by L'Oreal. So that, you know, that's yeah. A real... I was just going to add. Hi, Bob Sopko here. Um, I'm looking hi. it up. It was uh, Arnold and Seidel Miller. Yeah. The founders, and actually, if you look on the building on Euclid, it's the Ari and Seidel that the Cleveland uh, University Hospital oh, okay. is there. So yeah, it was here. I remember when they got acquired. Uh, I worked for a major drugstore chain. For 18 years that we uh, ended up selling the CVS. So I, I know this category a little bit. And for a while, when I was in the store, the L'Oreal line and other hair coloring lines was something I had to order. I had no clue how to do it as a guy, uh, you know, as an 18 year old, 19 year old. Um, yeah. But uh, but I remember the Seidel and uh, they were they're very philanthropic now from that sale. Uh, yeah, we're, we're involved in the business a little bit, I think, uh, post sale, and then you know, then did other things. So yeah, there it's very. Um, they were if, Arnie. From what I never met Arnie, I joined the company in two thousand three, and at that point, Arnie had already passed away. Unfortunately, his yeah. wife Nadella is still around, 
Um, but everyone tells me, I mean, Arnie was super charismatic and it was interesting. He created the brand. Be, it was meant to be a place where hairdressers all belonged, regardless of their, their background, their experience. It he actually created this on, a, um, the DNA of the brand was really inclusivity. And, you know, he called it matrix because the matrix is a network and he wanted a network. Of, <laughs> yeah. He wanted wow. a good, you should do this presentation. He wanted, um, no, I did not wanted, know that. I did not know that. So, um, oh, no, not, so cool. yeah, so he wanted it to be a place where hairdressers could connect and this network of, you know, hairdressers helping hairdressers. And oh, so that's wow. why he called it matrix. And, and it, that was really powerful back then because, you know, particularly in this industry, you had, you know, maybe in New York and in California, hairdressing, like, you know, it, it was more glamorous, but in the middle of a country, it was, you know, that you might've been as, as a young, you know, let's say a 17 year old, you go and you tell your parents that you're not going to college, you're going to beauty school and you're going to be a hairdresser. And, you know, your parents might've said over my dead body because they're thinking there's not, you know, how are you going to make money? How are you going to have a future in that? So that support from each other was really, really important. And Arnie provided that. And he was um, super charismatic too. He would, you know, when they did their, their meetings and their conferences and conventions, like they would all end up standing on tables and waving napkins around and things like that. But so we're trying to bring some of that back as well. <laughs> and, and in Cleveland, he was definitely an outlier because, you know, we do a lot of heavy industrial here. Yeah. For him to do something like that um, it was just unheard of. So he, he definitely stuck out, but very respected in community. But it's like, what is he doing? What? Who's yeah. going to do this? Why would you spend so much on something like that? <laughs> I wish I had known him. This is all right. So this is the rally towel. This is okay. our rally towel. And when we and when so when when like I said, Arnie and and Seidel, when they used to have these, you know, whether it was an internal meeting or a conference or convention, they would all people were so excited they would get up and stand up and they'd take their hotel napkin, you know, and they'd be swinging yeah. it around and like. And so we decided to take to bring that back and call it the rally towel because the rally napkin didn't sound very good. And, uh, and so we made it a rally towel and we made it rainbow because we are, um, our tagline is all hair types, all humans. And we are, um, you know, we renovated the brand around a message of inclusion. Um, and we made it rainbow. And then this is what we do at all of our meetings, whether it's virtual or um, live. And when it's live and in person, it's really fun because everybody just like swinging their rally towel around and dancing and going crazy, which is the reason why I like this industry. Cause I don't think you do that when you're marketing toothpaste. I think you only get to do that oh. <laughs> when you're marketing to hairdressers. Wow. Well, that, that's, that's honestly so fun. Um, so we had a question from LinkedIn live. And so this is from Tony, who is an undergraduate chemical engineer here at case. And so she said, it's so great to listen to your career journey and advice. To build off the ideas of entrepreneurship and innovation, have you or your colleagues, colleagues attended conferences or programs that are in collaboration with other companies within the beauty and personal care industry? And what are those experiences like? Well, um, attending other companies, meaning um, Maybe collaborating. Like big, big conferences like beauty conferences or big beauty programs, you know, the whole industry. Well, there, there's certainly several industry um, groups, like there's one cosmetic executive women, CEW, that I belong to. And I attend those events with my peers, uh, which is, you know, a great place to network and to meet other women that are in, and men, actually, it's also, um, you know, men are also invited to, to participate in CEW. Um, so I'll attend, you know, things like that. But um, I mean, there are other, I, I'm not sure, if that's the if that answers the question, or if it's more about um, you know there are other uh, big big events like um, CES and and things like that where you where people will go and they'll be you'll be interacting with other brands and other companies um, which I've actually never attended, but certainly there are there are um, you know industry organizations that we can be part of where we can network and brainstorm with other um, with other people in our industry. I think that that probably answers, I mean, it's a little bit hard from LinkedIn Live, but I hope that answers your question, Tony. Um, and then I think Zima 
I apologize if I pronounced that wrong. You sent a question in the chat if you would like to unmute and ask it. And if not, I can read it. Sure, I can ask it. Thank you so much. Um, my question was, um, have you seen uh, that the new shift to digital marketing has reduced overall cost on general marketing efforts now? And it can now be considered to be more valuable now rather than doing ad spending since it increases authenticity and engagement with your customers? hundred percent. It's, okay. it's, and in fact, when I started, um, you know, I was saying when I, when I started 20 years ago, we didn't market to the end consumer at all. And, 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 you know, all of our efforts were kind of focused on selling it into the distributor and then maybe into the salon and not to, but not to the consumer. And part of the reason was because it didn't, you know, economically, financially, it didn't make sense because we're sold through salons, not through, we're not supposed to be in, in drugstores and that, in, that's diverted product, which we could talk about in a separate <laughs> conversation, but, you know, so so the 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 idea of of spending millions of dollars on on traditional marketing traditional advertising that existed then like you know tv spots or outdoor billboards or that kind of thing i mean that was super super expensive and to spend that kind of money um we you know, we didn't have those resources in the professional division the consumer brands could do that because you know, it was relevant. Like you could, you could do something where you're spending millions on a TV ad and you know, let's say I'm, I'm you know, L'Oreal Paris or, or Maybelline and I have products in the drugstore. I'm reaching my consumer, they're watching TV and then they're going to go into the drugstore and they're going to, you know, they can buy it. But for me, I'm talking to a, a small part of the, of that population that's going into uh, not a small, but a, a smaller part that's going to go buy professional products in the salon. So it's just not very targeted. I mean, you all, you all know what about targeted marketing now, but it, it's not very targeted. So I, I couldn't even play in that space 20 years ago. I couldn't afford to spend millions of dollars on very untargeted, uh, um, you know, uh, media spend or, or advertising spend. So now I can actually play there and, you know, and it's much more affordable, you know, digital marketing is certainly even the playing field in a, in a certain, to a certain extent. Um, so now we can put dollars there and, I, and that's what, you know, I can put media dollars to reach my end consumer. And now I can target that consumer. I can be a much more segmented so that I'm not just like, you know, throwing money to the wind and not getting any return on that. So a hundred percent, it it's right. completely changed the game for us in the best way possible. You know, we can just be more, more targeted with our spend. Thank you so much for your answer. Thank you. And so I think this might be a, uh, one of our last questions. So Mindy asked a question in the chat if you would like to unmute uh, and ask it. Sure. First, I have to say your passion for what you do is so infectious. And, and I, early in my career, also went to work for a company that was very entrepreneurial, but provided that box or that frame, right? Or I used to describe it as some of the resources. So you weren't always cash poor, you know, yeah. idea rich, um, which was really a great thing. But, but my question is, you know, you talked about the internal process, right? We've got creative employees coming up with ideas for new products make the pitch, and that's part of the new product development cycle or, or innovation process, right? That the winners right. would, would get funded. You also mentioned your salon professionals are essentially entrepreneurs. Are you doing something similar to tap into their innovation? And, and if so, what does that look like? That is such a good idea. And no, we're not. <laughs> but I love it. And, and it actually has, it has been something we've talked about before. Cause I, you know, we, I was saying we have this beauty shakers, mm -hmm. uh, internal contest, a competition where, you know, we're come, we're incentivized to come up with different ideas. We, we have not created something like that, but the conversation has come up about, you know, how do we get our, um, you know, how can we get our customer essentially like our, our number one customer is salon. How can we kind of tap into their creative creativity and get them part of that? So I think it's a really, really good idea. And we haven't uh, necessarily done that yet. Um, we, I'll tell you, I do, I do hear a lot of their their ideas. I get emails <laughs> forwarded to me kind of on a daily basis of, you know, we have a great idea. I want to do this, and uh, and so we do get a lot of ideas from them. And I think if we formalized that and turned it into some sort of, um, you know, dialogue, it would be it would be a great idea. 
Yeah, it'd be just an interesting mix of like art and science. If you think about a salon owner saying, hey, I'm on a joint patent with L'Oreal because I was just mixing some stuff in my <laughs> in my back yeah. you know, room and you know found customers appreciated it and entered this competition or this discussion or this town hall, whatever, you know, and was able to do something like that. It, it could be a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I They're think it's very, a really and yeah, very entrepreneurial. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's a really good idea. Well, I got I, several years ago, I got an, an email from one of our, our um, salon owners and she was really excited because she had an idea for a product that she wanted to um, create. And she was curious if we would, you know, create that with her. And, um, and, and it was, it was an unfortunate coincidence because we actually were creating something that ha was along those same lines. And then it got into this awkward space of where I've said, you know, we're already doing that. And I didn't steal this idea from you. And I promise I'm, you know, so right. I, it, oh, yeah. But I think if we had some sort of formal program or something, I think it could be really, really interesting. I like yeah, that. Even if you think about, you know, the human centered design workshops and thinking about their journey as a stylist, maybe more than yeah. a salon owner. And how are they using the tools? How are they using the products? What size, what weight, what shape? you know, packaging, container, all that kind of stuff could, could apply to that would allow yeah. them, you know, more ergonomic, you know, sensitivity or more use, less use, more, For sure. more branding. So the consumer sitting in the chair sees it because it's often, you know, next to us or behind us, you're not seeing a hundred percent. Yeah. Pretty cool. We do. I will tell you one thing that we do is um, there are on some of the brands and we're starting this this year that we have an advocacy group. Um, so there's one on my, I, I was at, at Redkin before I came to Matrix, came back to Matrix. I was on, uh, I was the head of marketing for Redkin until two and a half years ago. And there, we had one um, demi-permanent color brand called Shades EQ. You, this is a professional product. You wouldn't see, you won't see this in, in drugstores or anything, but Shades EQ is beloved by hair. If you go into any salon and ask if they had use Shades EQ, they'll know what you're talking about. And it's just loved by everyone, you know, everyone in the industry. And, um, and so we created a few years ago, an advocacy group that started with about 10 or 15 and now it's several thousand and they're hairdressers who were just passionate about this product and want to have their voice heard. So they give us ideas on, um, you know, through this group, they give us ideas on, um, not just product development, but also, you know, content that they'd like to see education. They'd like to see techniques they'd like to see. Um, so we've, we've created that on the Redkin side. And we're we're looking at doing something like that similarly on um, on the matrix side as soon as we can. Um, it, it takes that love for this one and this one product, Shades of Q, just happens to have that. You know, it it just it has that kind of brand love. Um, so we need to find the right because you know to keep their engagement high, it has to be something they feel really passionately about. Yeah, it's so much fun to work on a product where you have that kind of brand love. It's it's yeah. magic. It's a magical experience. I don't know how to describe it, but it's awesome. Yeah. And when you don't have it, it's there's nothing more it's frustrating. Hard. You're like standing there screaming into the wind, you know, like, yep. you know, come on, you guys, why don't you love this? Right. <laughs> you guys like stamping your foot, you know, but it's really cool. You'll really like it. Because I've also been on the other side of that where we didn't listen to our customer. And we created a product that nobody wanted and nobody needed. And yet we told them, which was, you know, in the, old, I will say like in the old days, you ask what's different about L'Oreal then. And now I think L'Oreal, when I started 20 years ago, we were very focused on telling you what beauty was. And today we're very focused on hearing what you say beauty is and understanding beauty from the consumer's perspective. And so, um, you know, that will hopefully keep us from making some of those mistakes because I think. It, it, because we were telling you what beauty was, we created some products that nobody wanted. And, you know, the, it's not if you build it, they will come. It's really, you know, it, it, they, they flopped. <laughs> so. Well, thank you so much for this amazing session, Carrington. Um, Absolutely. I, yeah, I put in the chat on the link that Carrington gave to me for some student opportunities um, for anyone who is interested in getting involved. Um, and then as well, I just put in the chat that next Monday, January 30th, um, the next speaker series will be with Mike Fisher, who is the former CTO of Etsy. And that um, conversation will be to chat GPT or to not chat GPT. 
Um, but thank you so much for your time, Carrington. This really was so wonderful. And um, yeah, use that chat that um, that link because I didn't know that it was all that apparently uh, was created just this past fall. They put everything kind of in a one stop shop for students, and it's really really there are a lot of really cool opportunities that I didn't know about. I knew about um, Brandstorm, which is a global kind of case competition. Um, there's a, now there's a mentorship program for students. Um, there's you know every, all of the links to apply for positions, there's internships. So there's a lot. I, I look back on 20 years ago when I got my job and A, I probably wouldn't have gotten the job today if I, <laughs> if I applied because I sort of came, you know, they would have looked at my my uh, non-linear path in my 20s and said, this is very unfocused. But, but I was Gen X. We were able to do that back then. <laughs> we had to go find our passion. <laughs> but it's a really great link and a lot of, inf of great information in there. So um, yeah, I definitely encourage everyone to check it out. Well, thank you so much. And I guess Michael, are any? No, that's great. Yeah, thank you. Uh, this is great. And we did thank you. The, the Princeton uh, alumni party continues. We'll have, pick, we'll have to cook up next. Actually, Dave Rothenberg just called me while you were on. And so we'll, maybe, maybe he's our next one. Oh, absolutely. Are you kidding me? Definitely get him. Mr. Rocket. Yeah. Yeah, sure. By the way, I'm, I'm actually, interestingly, um, you know, you were talking about all the, about Arnie Miller and everything. I'm actually coming to Cleveland on the 7th and 8th to visit, you know, to kind of like walk Arnie's steps and visit some of our top salons out there who are still, you know, have, have been our customers for 40 years. And um, so, and, uh, and you know, yeah. <laughs> All of this is kind of in that in the effort to reconnect with some of the customers that now, again, like I was saying, that renovation is a little bit, uh, you know, change is hard for some people. So I'm kind of coming out to okay. to meet with some of those salons and assure them that the the heart of the brand has not changed. We might look a little different on the outside, but it's it's still the the same. You know, the heart of the, and the DNA of the brand hasn't changed. But so I'll be in Cleveland. All see right. if you can. We'll see you. Up. Text, let's. We'd love to see you when you're here. All right. See Thanks, you. guys. Thank that was really fun. Thank you so much. Talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.